There's something about visually experiencing, you know, worship besides, you know, doing it ourselves. I'll never forget the most impressive salvation. Um, and I'm going to have you up, come up in a second, so raise my hand if I get <laughs> sidetracked. <laughs> Was, when we were pastoring in, in Nevada, um, we had a lady, and she had two daughters, and they came to church really regularly. And her husband was an alcoholic and just kind of one of those mean alcoholics. And we had a, now remember, this is a small church. I mean, in a radius of 50 miles, there was probably 2,500 people. No fast food restaurants. We had a gas station. No banks within 50 miles. And we put on a Easter program, and the kids were in it, and so the alcoholic dad wanted to come to the Easter program, or he was pulled into the come to church that Sunday to see his daughters in the program. And he ended up getting saved, and he, he became a fantastic Christian. I mean, just, he was so prophetic and so in love with Jesus. But... He got saved because in our, you know, it, it, there was no fanfare. We didn't have money for big productions, you know. So Jesus, you know, had a sheet that made it look like a, a robe and a cross. And in the, the play, the guy who was playing Jesus is walking from the back of the church down the aisle to the cross. And... The alcoholic father is sitting on the edge so he can see Jesus as he walks by. And he has this weird thought. He said, this is how he got saved. The guy walks by, and because it's just a, a half sheet, he looks down and he sees this guy's hairy legs. And he has this thought, Jesus had hairy legs. But in his mind, what happened is it shifted from a fake Jesus to real Jesus. We never know what movement, what thing is going to draw people. Isn't it amazing? I love it. So I want to introduce my good friend, um, Connie Jones. I love her. Um, her and her husband used to pastor, and now she's chosen to work for us at Igniting Hope. And I love her because she's funny. She's got my sense of humor. I don't have to worry about, you know, whoops, shouldn't have said that. And, and she buys me shoes, and she's got obviously good taste in shoes. So <laughs> I just wanted her to share something that's on her heart, testimony, whatever, you know, or if you want to share about the fake country of Moldovia. <laughs> I told Wendy I did make it up because I just wanted a break. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I love Wendy. I love working with them. It's so funny. There'll be so many times I'll say something and I'll think, man, Wendy would totally appreciate that. <laughs> this is a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be here with you guys. And sister, what's your name? Yeah. Diane. Oh, my goodness. Talk about... You, I just had this while you were dancing, just the glory of God that was coming off of you in waves and slammed me against us. And I thought, for the joy that was set before him, you're the joy. That's what he's talking about. Somebody who just steps into who they are and shows forth the king inside you. And man, how many appreciated that? It was just fantastic. Well, I'm kind of at a loss to what to share, so I'll just share that um, my husband and I, Wendy said we were pastoring, uh, minister's kid, grew up in the church, my, my husband, my parents were pastors, and I found out that just because you go to church, it doesn't make you a Christian, <laughs> and just because you think you know Jesus, it doesn't mean you know anything, and I was so encountered by the Lord years after I thought I was serving him. I just thought I was bad at it, I thought I wasn't any good at it, and I encountered Jesus when I was 21 years old. And it transformed my life because there's something so different about knowing about him 
and experiencing the moving of him inside you. And one of the reasons why I stayed here with them, I did uh, another school. I'm like a Bible school junkie. I did my second school at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, and Steve and Wendy got on the platform my first year. And I'm sure you guys experienced this, a Wendy. She just keeps dropping these bombs. And she just says one thing with her, <laughs> and your life just got blown up. <laughs> And I still have the page that I wrote notes on because I knew God and I had this wonderful word of faith background, a Pentecostal background, but I didn't live in victory. I didn't have any area of my life. We'd pastored for years. I was actually currently pastoring that year. It was our last year pastoring. And I realized I didn't have any victory in my life. And it was all about the mindset, thinking different, coming in alignment with who you are. And when she started talking about so many things about living from the Spirit, living and accessing the Spirit of God. It transformed my life. And I remember sitting in that moment saying, if I stick around and do third year, if I ever serve another ministry, I would serve them. And, you know, all these years later, here I am serving them. And it's something so profound when you recognize that you're the joy. You're the whole idea. The whole reason Jesus came and suffered and died and resurrected was so he could resurrect you. I love her message of sitting at the right hand currently, sitting in Christ currently, sitting in a place of authority right now. And it's something I just see that to be in release to a greater level is actually being able to look at every single circumstance in your life through the, like leaning over the throne room and looking at like with God going, yep, oh yeah, I see that we're victorious. I see that we're victorious. And I love this morning talking about the image is everything. The image of Christ, it's not just imprinted on me, it is me. The image of Jesus is me. And the Lord showed me something in Genesis, and I'll stop after this. Um, <laughs> words are so important in the way that they're organized in the Bible. And in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, I created. And then he goes through this series, and he creates, you know, the heavens, and he creates the waters, and he creates this and that. But when he gets to life, he says, the plant whose seed is in itself that reproduces after itself. And then he goes to the animals whose seed is in itself that reproduces after itself. And it's like a little redundant. Then he goes to the, the birds of the air and the, the fish in the sea whose seed is in itself, who reproduces after itself. And then there's a pause and he says, hmm, let us make man in our image. Let my seed be in man and let them reproduce after me. And man, whew, that is who and what we are. And then he turns it and he says, and you go, you replenish. And you guys all know we lost. You know, somebody made a bad decision back in the Garden of Eden. But Jesus, he came, and he came not only as our Savior, but he came as the living example of what it looks like when a son and daughter stands up whose seed of God is in them and reproduce after them. And this is why I serve this woman. <laughs> And her wonderful husband in Igniting Hope Ministries. And so bless you guys. Thank you so much for letting us be here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <sighs> now you know why I like her. I found the scripture. <laughs> oh, and it's so good. But before I read it, I'm going to read some other scripture. Just keep you on your toes here to lead up to this. Oh, my goodness. Matthew 23, 13. I always just jump in. I get so excited about the message that I forget to do all the soft and fuzzy things like, I love you, Debbie. <laughs> and Terry. Uh, and I love what God's doing in this place, actually. I mean... I was a little tired, I'll admit it, last night. <laughs> but I got energized being, just feeling what you guys are going after and the hunger and, and just, I could feel God's in the midst of shifting things around and ready to reveal his people in a whole new light and a whole new way. And you're invited into that. And I do not get depressed about where you're at now because you're not going to stay the same. 
So Matthew 23, 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. A lot of times we think that's talking about you're keeping people from salvation. You're keeping people from when they die, go into heaven. But that doesn't make any sense. They haven't died yet, so they're obviously not, they couldn't enter in while they're alive anyway. So why is he accusing them of not entering in? The kingdom is here. It's now, but it's an unseen realm. It's not just an unseen um, theology. It's an actual place. It's a it's a realm that we are supposed to have access to. And the, the thing is, is that religious people are, are, he's accusing the religious people from keeping the people from entering in. And so the kingdom of heaven is actually shut up by religious, passionless, visionless, fearful souls who do not want to submit to a realm they cannot see or understand with the natural mind. There is this fear. We get all hooked up on, oh, I don't want to be afraid, you know, in the world. And we don't even realize we're afraid of entering into God's world. We tend to think, oh, Jesus, I invite you into my world. But we forget the fact that Jesus has invited us into his realm. So, here's my scripture, John 10, 9. Meditate on this. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And, this is a big and, and will go in and out and find pasture. So he obviously isn't talking about when you die, going to heaven, because you don't go in and out. He's talking about the realm of the kingdom, a place that has substance and even more substance than what we feel is substantial. You, you neither go in and you keep other people with your fears out. And we need to go in. We, we need to go in because the world doesn't need someone with good character. I love people with good character. Please have it. But I've seen non-Christians have good character. We are in a state of being right now in the world where we need more than character to change it. We need to know we're supernatural. We need to have a identity shift that is so huge that we just carry something totally different. I love the fact in Scripture that after Jesus died, I think it's in Acts somewhere, and I think it's, I um, can't remember who they were talking about, whether it was Peter and John or some of the disciples. And the people, this is the Scripture that, hits me it says and the people took note that they had been with Jesus and this is where our power comes from it's from being in his presence until what we are begins to rise up and stay up have you ever had a a spiritual moment where you feel so powerful in the spirit the worship your whole church service goes good you're like yeah 
you know, my depression's gone now. And then you go home and it's all back. And we tend to think, oh, well, that was just the anointing or something. No, it was just that our body is so used to being defined a certain way that it just takes over. And if we believe that that moment of being powerful was just a uh, sovereign move of God letting us have a little experience, every experience is an invitation about this is how you're supposed to live. What do I need to, to live like this? Um, I had a, a, a time when I was pastoring in Nevada and me and a girlfriend went to Las Vegas to see, um, I think it was Rodney Howard Brown. And the presence was so thick in that room. And he had done an altar call for pastors to come up. And so I went up and I got slammed on the floor and... God just kept quoting. It was almost like he was prophesying into my life. And he just kept, kept quoting Isaiah 61 to me and telling me to preach the gospel and to set captives free. And it, it was just life-changing. So I, I get up and practically crawl to my seat. And I'm sitting there after the service and and I, I'm just lost in this presence of what God had done inside of me. And I open my eyes and I realize, oh, the, the building's empty. <laughs> but I didn't want to leave because in my experience, once you left the anointing, you went back to normal. And I remember sitting there and, and I'm arguing with myself. My girlfriend, I know she's wants to go back to our hotel and I'm but the other part of me is like I don't want to leave this I, I don't want to leave this experience what I feel like you've done in me and as clear as day I hear God say Wendy you can live like this because it wasn't something he was doing to me. It was him revealing what was in me. This feeling that, that you, you're worthwhile, that you're able to, to preach even though you've never preached before. <laughs> it's the real you. And when I did actually begin to be obedient, and while we were pastoring there a few times, I tried to preach. And there, after that experience, it was like I would get up and I would start out as me preaching, and then it would feel like something would just come over me. All of a sudden, my preaching got powerful, and you know, I, I just I didn't have to go off notes anymore. It was just the spirit. And literally one day I'm preaching and that anointing comes on me and another part of me steps back and goes, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> is that me just faking it being a different person? And God said, no, Wendy, that's the real you. So when you are the real you, you feel the most powerful. If you've never felt powerful and clean and loved and victorious, you've never felt you. You're still running off the dead you. <laughs> but I, I, I love Isaiah 61. It's my life calling. Um, I started out because it, it to me it, it's all about setting captives free. So I got into you know sozoing people, counseling people to set them free, um, dealing with people with addictions or um, other bondages. And God said that's not really your true calling because freedom 
isn't just about being free from something. It's about being free to be something. And he said, like I said last night, he gave me that phrase that most of his children are born again, but entombed in their past. They're entombed in their body, and they've allowed who they think they are to entomb who they really are. And he said, because, it, and first you have, you can't preach something that you've never experienced. I mean, you don't have to experience it fully because I'm still stepping into new freedoms. But you'll be most passionate about the message of God that has actually changed your life. <laughs> I can't help but preach about the Spirit. Because that gave me hope. Because I really couldn't see the old me becoming what God said I was. But when I started having more faith in my new creation than in my body, in my talents that I thought I had or didn't have, something happened. Defining yourself different. Um, trying to remember what I shared last night. I don't want to repeat myself. So in my journey, one of the things that when I first became a Christian was my first thought of being a Christian is learning how to die. I mentioned that last night, I know. But even after I got out of that, I was just constantly trying to fix me. You know, here, let me tinker with this and maybe it'd have more power. Let me tinker with this. And God said, Wendy, I don't want you to fix what's dead. The Christian life is not about fixing something or dying. The Christian life is about becoming something. Don't try to fix something. Look at what you are and become it. Like children, you know, I, I'm i totally fascinated. God talks to me a lot about, you know, the way things work in the kingdom by watching children. And I remember when our um, first grandson was learning to walk and our daughter was constantly texting us, you know, Caden took a step, you know, we'd get all excited. Um, she never texted and said, he fell down 50 times today. We don't think he's a walker. <laughs> but do you know that's what we do? We determine our future by the 50 falls, not the one step. But when we're dealing with a baby, they take one step and it's like, oh, he is a walker. And there's no condemnation for the 50 faults. You know, the reason religious churches don't have joy is because religion only celebrates perfection. Families celebrate progress. We don't wait until the toddler walks perfectly to celebrate him. As soon as he takes a step, as soon as he stands on his own, wobbling, but he's standing, we celebrate. And why? Because we know celebration energizes, literally. And God began to tell me, Wendy, I need you to literally celebrate your, your steps and your progress. Because it will give you energy to keep trying. Stop focusing on the 50 falls and celebrate the step. And then he took it further. He loves to just challenge me. And he said, every time you fail or fall, I want you to celebrate. And I'm like, what? 
celebrate my, my failures and my fall? And he said, yes, because you cannot fall unless you were standing. <laughs> right? Celebrate. I didn't make it to the couch, but I made it to the doorway. Woohoo! I am on my way. I am a walker. I am a talker. Don't use your failures to define you. So the Christian life is embracing, and it's a, just like in the natural, a baby has to learn how to walk, how to talk. In fact, you know, I, I used to think, you know, if I failed as much as a one-year-old did in their first year of life, I would need those covers. Because the first year of a baby's life, all they do is fail. They try to grab things and they can't. I mean, they can barely lift their head. But they begin to build muscle. They begin, they don't think of failure as an identity. It's a process. So God began to talk to me and and. And I'm like, you know, how come they're not discouraged and depressed with all this failure? And he said, the reason babies aren't discouraged and depressed, even in just a halfway decent home, is because they're so convinced they can do what their parents do that failure doesn't move them. I mean, we've been hearing a lot that we are created in his image. Intuitively, babies know they're created in the image of their parents. So when they fail, they don't define their future by that. They don't define themselves by their past. They define themselves by what their parents can do. Do you get that? They define themselves by what their daddy can do. My dad's a walker. I must be a walker. I will continue to try to walk until I walk because I'm made in his image. And he said, babies are so convinced that they're made in their parents' image that failure doesn't move them. And I realized that's my problem. I'm not convinced I can do what my daddy does. I've got so much religious garbage in my head that tries to make up excuses about why people weren't healed when I prayed for them or why they didn't get, you know, raised from the dead or why, you know, whatever it is I'm making excuses for and trying to blame it on something on, you know, that I'm just not made for that. God can't trust me with that. I mean, literally, when babies are learning to walk, I can't trust them. So when they're learning to walk, I actually have to put protection around. I don't sit them on the couch and say, ha, you're not allowed to walk until I know you're not going to fall and hit your head on that table. You're not allowed to walk until I know you won't walk into danger. You're not worthy of walking yet. And yet we think that's what God's doing. I'm not worthy enough to heal the sick because, you know, there, there must be something wrong with me. We have to trust him. He's the dad. He's going to give you power to do things and on the way. Until you're mature enough to handle it all, he'll have little coverings and protections around about you. So that when you fall and you hit your head on the table, it won't be sharp glass. He's that big and that good. 
If we keep waiting, if we keep thinking, well, it's just not, just not our time. I'm not good enough yet to be that powerful. And yet I have met people who have been saved for one day and seen them heal people and cast out demons. So good. And this whole thing about, you know, the anointing, we kind of think of it in a weird way. We think of it as something that, and, and it, it can be. You know how a lot of things in the Bible, it's not this or this, sometimes it's both. So anointing can be something that just falls on you for a, a season and a purpose that God wants to do. But it's really impossible not to be anointed when you are made in God's image. <laughs> and a lot of us, we're, we're wanting to somehow get to this anointed stage where I can do what somebody I admire is doing, whether it's healing or getting people saved, whatever. And I, I, I was always after the anointing. It's like, oh, my goodness. You know, you have the anointing and you get stuff done. Stuff that you just dream about. And so I remember one day crying out for the anointing, as usual. And God said, Wendy, it's not that hard to be anointed. And I'm like, could you have told me that two years ago? And I'm like, why is it not hard? And he said, it's so easy, even a handkerchief can do it. You know, Acts 19. Handkerchiefs and aprons were just in the presence of people who had been changed by God. And other people would just take the handkerchiefs and put them on the sick, and they'd be healed. And they'd put the handkerchief on people who were demon-possessed, and they would be delivered. The handkerchief didn't say all the right words. <laughs> it hadn't fasted and prayed. Or sacrificed. It was just in the presence. What's the difference between us and a handkerchief? Our belief system. It's clogging it up. We're trying to get something we already have. We're trying to become something we already are. You know, when the, the caterpillar, before it's a butterfly, it doesn't, it, it may look at a butterfly and say, wow, I wish I could do that. But it doesn't actually, you know, jump off buildings and, you know. <laughs> I'm flying. <laughs> because caterpillars can't fly but you can. You may still be, you know, when I think about the cocoon, the, the, butter, the caterpillar goes into the cocoon and it, it's limited in what it can do until it fully becomes what it is and then it breaks out of the cocoon. I believe that when you fully know who and what you are, the cocoon that has had you encased, entombed, and this is your season. You've been sitting in a cocoon. I've been sitting in a cocoon waiting for that moment when I realize, huh, I've got wings that can break this cocoon. Oh, nothing happened. Maybe I'm not a butterfly. I might still be a caterpillar. No, the butterfly continues. And in the, the resistance of the cocoon, the, the wings get strong enough. So when it breaks out of the cocoon, it's fully developed and ready to fly. Wow. 
Can you get a picture of yourself? Let, let's stop thinking about our body as who we are. Think of your body as a big, fat, white, ugly cocoon. And your spirit man is in there. This butterfly with wings, with the ability to bring salvation, not just to people, but to the earth. To restore. We don't need more environmentalists. We need children of God who know how to throw sticks in the water and make the water sweet. No, I'm serious. I'm totally serious. When we come out of our cocoon, we will be able to make what man has destroyed and re rebring life to it. Everywhere the river goes, there's life. The problem is, is we've been brainwashed to believe in death. This may get sticky. You don't have to agree with me. Just wildly speculate. I remember having the thought, when Adam and Eve sinned, before that, there was no death, right? They lived hundreds and hundreds of years. Why did it take so long for human beings to stop living hundreds and hundreds of years? Have you noticed how, you know, we're happy if we, we reach 100? My theory is that because they were unfamiliar with death, they didn't have a lot of faith in it. I mean, we've got science that, you know, second law of thermodynamics. According to science, this law means everything is wearing out. The earth is wearing out. Your body's wearing out. Everything's wearing out. That's the spirit of death. Can we have faith for a spirit of life? What if we actually started believing that we can stop the cycle, that when Jesus paid it all, he stopped the curse? He actually stopped the curse of death. But we are still living under that curse because that doesn't feel like that can change. This is where the wildly speculation comes in. Scripture? Yes. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength as eagles. They will run and not be weary. That does not work under the second law of thermodynamics. If you keep running, you will get tired every, every time, and all the experts say so. And God says, they will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. They will rise up on wings as eagles. What if the spirit within us is so powerful? And, and scripture again, Jesus or the Bible says, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. It does not visit you. Do you have faith? What if we believed that we have a substance that is so powerful it overrides the second law of thermodynamics? I can make my body run and not be weary.
you don't have to believe all this. I'm just trying to get us all out of our box and out of our cocoon. Um, just to challenge how much thinking is based on living under a curse. You weren't just redeemed from sin. You were redeemed from the curse. What should that look like? Remember, Adam and Eve, before they fell, they would walk in the garden with Jesus, I mean, with God. The question, in my mind, is was it the physical garden or because they were still alive in God? Were they going back and forth and living in two realms? What would happen if we became aware of the kingdom? We love to say, you know, thy kingdom come. And yet none of us know what that looks like. Because <laughs> we haven't spent time in his presence for him to show us what it looks like what it feels like. Here's a challenge. I've never done this before. I challenge a few of you who feel led by the Spirit to do this to totally turn your devotion time upside down. Don't pray for anything. Yikes. Because, you know, when it talks about Jesus going up leaving the disciples and going up on the mountain to spend time with God. I don't think he was up there, oh, God, heal the, the blind man, and I'm probably going to see a leper tomorrow, so I'm praying for him to be healed. No, I think he was in God's presence to remind himself where he came from and who he was. What if we used our devotion time like that? I need to remind myself that I'm one with the Prince of Peace, that I carry peace everywhere I go. I need to remind myself that I am immersed in the glory of God. It swirls in me and out of me, and I'm one with God's glory. And you picture it however you want to picture it. You know, we're not going to make a theology about what you see in your prayer time, you're just going to allow Holy Spirit to lead you, to show you what things are like. But to do that, you have to start learning to trust what you see in your imagination. God created it so he could show you things that were unseen. Because it's hard to describe something that you've never seen. We have to believe that we can actually give our imagination back into the hands of God. God, let me see. Just kind of test the waters out. Okay, did I really see that? Is that true? When you go on that journey of being a student of the Spirit, God begins to bring, he, at least for me, and I sh I'm sure he will for you, he began to bring confirmation moments. Yes, Wendy, that was right. That was exactly it. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I talked earlier about, you know, the struggle I had with believing that I was prophetic, and I forgot where I was going with it, but I finally was convinced I was prophetic after God, be, you know, took out all the comparisons, and I just began to be what I was. And um, then about 10 years ago, um, I, I got started into reading about um, the mystics um, in the like 1600s and 1700s and stuff, and they they were Christians. Some of them were um, monks, nuns, and you hardly hear anything about them. But there were. I remember reading one story about this one monk who would just disappear. I mean, 
they all live in this monastery and everybody would be like, well, where's brother so-and-so? Where is he? And so finally somebody goes, when we can't find you, where are you? And he says, I'm usually sitting right there, but I just ask God to make me so small that you can't find me. What? <laughs> he didn't limit his Christianity to what a normal person could do. And so I, I got started reading on this and kind of was having this thing because I'm passionate about the things of the Spirit and wanting to know the mysteries of God because that's all a mystic is, someone who's interested in the mysteries of God. And, uh, I mean, there could be New Age mystics, too, that do something totally different. But we all know that you can't counterfeit something that doesn't have on the opposite side a real thing. Nobody's going to counterfeit money that doesn't actually exist. <laughs> and Satan can't invent things. He's not a creator. So anything that we see new age, psychics, even witches and stuff do, they're doing what is actually possible for Christians. Only we can do it legally. They can't. They're illegal. So I just had this experience where I, I knew I was into it, but I, I never like to call myself anything. You know, I'm humble and, you know, it's like I would never come up and say, yeah, I'm Prophet Wendy. <laughs> it's like, if you don't know I'm a prophet, I, I'm not a prophet. So, I mean, I, I'm okay with titles. I mean, that's fine. But anyway, I've always struggled with it because I struggled with pride and not wanting to bring attention to myself. And, but deep inside, I was thinking, I wonder if I'm a mystic. And I went to South Africa a few years ago before COVID. And... Steve and I, when we go over there, we usually separate because there's too many places to, that want us to speak, and so we can't go together. So we get over there together. We separate. I go to this one church, and the pastor and his wife are driving me back to my room, and the pastor goes, that was amazing. You are such a mystic. And I'm like, huh, no one's ever called me that before. That's interesting. And so, I, you know, you hide that in your heart like Mary did. <laughs> and I get to my room, and I'm going over some, you know, I, I encourage myself by my own notes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll reread things that God's spoken to me and that I've preached on. And so I opened up my Actually, it was my phone, because I, nowadays I have my notes on my phone. And I'm scrolling through the notes, and I see one that I don't recognize. So I click on it, and it, it says January 1st, and I can't remember the date right now. And I'm like, I don't remember writing this. And all the notes say is God told me I was a mystic. And I'm like, I did not write that. I do not remember writing that. It was bizarre. And why would I find it right after the pastor said that? It was just one of those things where God, he likes to confirm. And he will. The first time I ever tried to prophesy, it was so scary. Oh my goodness. I was going to, I was driving four hours from where we lived to Las Vegas because a, um, a lady in our church, her son had broken a bone or something and they had to care flight him to Las Vegas to the hospital and the mother went too. 
in the helicopter, so she had no car there. So I'm driving down there, and I'm praying and praying in tongues. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, God, I really want to you know, release this prophetic. I want to get over this fear I have of speaking to strangers. And so I'm like, give me something. You know, just share something about someone that you want me to prophesy into their life. And he said, okay, when you get to the hospital, you're going to meet a nurse. And her name is Mary. And I'm like, can you come up with a more unusual name? <laughs> Odds are she's going to be Mary. And he goes, okay, her husband's name is George. I'm like. George, again, can you have something a little more pizzazz, you know? This is probably just my mind making it up because my mind is so uncreative that it just comes up with the names Mary and George. So I get into the room with my friend, and there's a nurse in there, and God in my heart goes, that's Mary. And I froze. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> because you know how much more powerful the word, word would be if I knew her name was Mary and she hadn't told me? But I froze. I couldn't do it. I felt condemned. Told my friend later, because <laughs> afterwards she said her name was Mary, of course. And so I'm, I'm pouring out my heart to my friend, and she goes, ah, oh, that's okay, Wendy. You know, God will give you another chance. But the thing is, is Mary said that tomorrow she was going to be moved to another whole wing of the hospital and said her goodbyes because I won't see you again. So I go back to the hospital the next day, and Mary go, comes in, and she goes, I'm in another wing, but I just had to come in and see how you guys are doing. And I'm like, okay, tell her you know her husband's name is George. Nothing came out. I'm sitting there frozen in fear. And then she starts talking to my friend about her husband, George. I'm like, I blew it. <laughs> and he said, you're in school. Get over it. You just needed confirmation. It wasn't that big of a deal. You just needed to know and trust what you're hearing, what you're seeing. So Don't focus on the fact that you didn't give the word. Celebrate you got the word. Because next time, you'll have more confidence to do it. You were right last time. So giving our, our imagination to God and allowing him to paint pictures of what the unseen realm looks like. Stop being afraid. A lot of people, when they first started the whole prophetic, you know, when the movement came, and, and I shared how, for me, we were taught that you didn't choose to prophesy. God just sovereignly zapped you. You know, it's called the zappage theory. <laughs> I wasted 15 years of my Christian life waiting to be zapped. Am I good enough to be zapped yet? And um, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> Jesus. So what he began to do is he said, it, it's not about waiting for me to sovereignly zap you to prophesy. And we started getting these prophetic people like Chris Vallotton and others who began to say, 
we're all called to prophesy. God is called the word he likes to speak. And anybody who's willing to listen can hear. And you pay attention to things that are highlighted on somebody and by faith you just step out or something that comes to your mind and so you just step out and you don't worry about whether it failed or not. It's a learning experience. It's okay to even tell people, you know, I'm new at this. It's okay if, if I'm off, but, you know, whatever. So we had a turning moment in the, the stream of, of church that I was involved in where we went from you could only prophesy under sovereign unction and zappage to you may prophesy anytime. You just have to be in the spirit, listening for his voice, and you can speak. So we, I realized... We hear stories about people having encounters with God, people who have been seeing angels and demons since they were three years old, and we're like, but they're just, you know, well, the ones who see demons aren't lucky, but <laughs> the others, you know, we're like, why is it that they just get zapped? And that's where the zappage theory comes from. There are some people who have been sovereignly zapped with certain anointings, and they've been doing it since they were three. Used to really bug me. In fact, I remember telling God, you know, this is not fair. You know, they get to be level 10 Christians, and I'm a three. Because they're so powerful. Reinhardt Bonkies, those people, they're powerful. They're, they're level tens and we're, you know, sovereignly destined for threes. <laughs> I'm serious. Most of you out there have an unspoken belief system that you're destined to be a lower level Christian than somebody else. So when I was talking to God about it, he said, you know, Wendy, I, I have sovereignly zapped some people with certain anointings, but it's not for the reason you suppose. And I'm like, well, then why? And he said, I had to do it so the rest of you would know what's available. When you see a powerful man or woman of God flowing in the anointing and the spirit of God, it's not a statement about you that you lack something. It's an invitation to you. This is what is possible in the kingdom. Don't get discouraged that they got it for free and you're going to have to, you know, do some mind renewal for it. That's just life. There's some things that you got for free that they didn't. I used to get mad at people who couldn't do what I did naturally <laughs> until I realized, oh, <laughs> I don't have to work at that. I was just given this gift to be able to do that. We can't judge people, you know, if they're not up to how you can do it. If it's easy for you, you were probably born able to do it. Everybody else is trying to play catch up. So give them some grace. <laughs> so anyway, there's this belief system that encounters are only for zappy moments. You prayed long enough, the anointing in the room was big enough, and you saw a vision. You felt like you met Jesus. And then you wait for another 50 years for it to happen. <laughs> Until we change our belief system. Just like the prophetic is not a zap moment, it can be zapped. But for most of us, we actually begin to believe we can do it. We begin trying it like a baby learning to walk. 
Encounters are the same thing. It's not a zappy moment. God does that so we know it's possible, but we have an open invitation. We just have to stop trying to meet with God in our brain. The moment I strive too hard to feel or see God or hear God, I lose God because my spirit doesn't strive. When I'm striving, it means my brain's trying to meet with God. You know what interests me is, do you guys have self-serve gas stations? Okay, good. You know in the state of Oregon, you're not, it's illegal to fill your car up with gas. The gas station attendant must do it. Probably the only state still in that mode, but we go to a gas station and we grab this thing and we pull a handle and we see the dollar things going crazy. We've never seen anything come out of this hose, but we're wasting our time. You know, if an alien came and saw us, they'd be like, what are you doing? Oh, well, can't you see? I do not. <laughs> I'm filling my car up with gas. Where's the gas? Just trust me. Coming, coming from there to here. So we stand there wasting our time by faith that something's going in. And then we're so full of faith that something went in, we pay big bucks for something we never saw. <laughs> and then a little meter on my car says, you need more gas. Okay. How many of you, when you see the meter go to empty, look in your gas tank and is it... Is it really empty? <laughs> so God brought this to my mind because one day I was soaking in his presence. And I love the times when I'm in his presence and I have an experience. And, you know, God's speaking to me. And I feel like I'm getting healed up. And I love those encounters. And then I noticed that occasionally I would go and I'd, I'd spend my hour, you know, soaking in his presence and I felt nothing, heard nothing, saw nothing. And inside it was like, well, that was a waste of an hour. And God said, can you take it by faith? Can you believe that it's impossible to be in my presence and not receive something? Are you willing to waste time sitting in my presence believing something is happening to me? Because it's impossible to go to a gas station and press this button and nothing happened. And the crazy thing is, is something is happening. You didn't experience it. Your spirit did, but your mind was unable to put words to it, to know what happened. But when I started attaching faith to soaking in his presence as if I was, I'm just, you know, I'm empty. I'm going to go lay down before the Lord. I'd love to hear, see, feel but even if I don't, he's filling me back up. He's giving me an adjustment. You can have encounters. What time are we supposed to be over? Just, do I have time for an encounter? <laughs> Not just me, you. <laughs> Watch me have an encounter. <laughs> And I actually
actually have a CD or you could just download it as an MP3. Um, on What I do is I walk you through how my mind is working and what I'm doing in my thoughts when I'm having an encounter that increases the um, chance that you'll actually feel and see and, and, and know you're having an encounter. The first thing to believe is that you are supposed to have encounters. You're his child. You are, you know, the invitation is out for you to come. You can go in and out. And, and that scripture I read, it said, go in and out and find pasture. I believe the reason a lot of Christians have not found the pasture and the peace and the healing is because they don't go in. The pasture is not of this earth. It's his realm. We get readjusted. Our, our spirit man rises up in his realm and, and our brain and our body gets reminded about what it really is. And, you know, the body's just a suit for, you know, so that we don't look weird to other people. Let's just close our eyes. One thing I want to share to you, yeah, just keep that music going, that's awesome, is I've read somewhere that 80% of all Americans are living under constant stress and they don't know it. They think it's normal. They think this is how everybody lives. Your shoulders are tense, your neck's muscles ache, you're in a constant place of stress. And for those who live there, it, it can be a little harder to find the place of peace because it's you don't go there enough. So what we're gonna do is learn how to relax. You're just gonna, you know, wiggle your shoulders, your hands, just shake off stress. Take a deep breath. And I, I mean, take a breath where, put your hand on your belly and take a deep breath and make sure your belly expands when you take a breath. They need to have a class in public school on how to breathe. <sighs> I didn't learn this till I was 35. I was a shallow breather. But you learn to take a deep breath and it brings oxygen and rest. It cleanses out some things. So just take that deep breath, hold it, and then just blow out stress. This is a visual that helps our mind to attach faith to what's happening in us. Visuals are good. Whatever works to find our place of peace in Him. So just take a breath. Pretend like you're just breathing in the air of heaven. It's life-giving. It's coming straight from the mouth of God. Like when Jesus blew on the disciples. Allow him to blow, and then you just suck it in. And there's healing in that breath. There's peace in that breath. If you want to lay down or come to the front, you know, just get comfy. Because we want to forget about our body and connect spirit to spirit. It's hard to connect spirit to spirit until you know how to connect to your spirit. So just relax, Father, as we go on this encounter. I just ask for protection over everybody's mind, emotions, body, their 
protect their imagination. We just submit it all to you and to your spirit. We thank you that light is more powerful than darkness and that your presence here is covering all of us. And the invitation is out because we all know that when we behold him, we become like him. When we behold him, we are transformed into his image where our very being shifts, our view of reality shifts, and we come into contact with a realm called the kingdom that we have access to not only for ourselves, but for our loved ones and for our circumstances. So now, just in your mind's eye, for a visual picture, your spirit man just standing up. Your body still sitting or laying, but your spirit man, that part of you that is seated in heavenly places, that knows the presence, that knows the will of God and the purposes of God. It's standing up, it's stretching its wings and it wants to fly. Yeah. Just keep your mind's eye on your spirit. If you want, you can picture it in heaven with Jesus. Maybe Jesus wants to take you on a tour Maybe he wants to show you something else. The key here is when you latch on to the spirit and you know you're in God's presence, stop listening to me. Do whatever Jesus wants you to do. But I'm going to continue talking because sometimes people who are struggling to enter into this place need more visuals. They need to hear, you know, something encouraging or, or something that will spark their spirit. So just relax. If you find yourself striving too hard to see or feel something, go into what I call handkerchief mode. You're just going to pretend to be a handkerchief in the presence of God receiving just receiving we're learning how to receive I feel like there's some people who their minds are going really fast you've got questions um, or there's stress and I feel like God wants you to enter into the Prince of Peace. You're going to receive peace, not from out there, but you're going to pull on the peace that is within you, that your spirit carries. Now just feel the peace of God. It's like a warm, fuzzy blanket or a fog and it's starting to surround you and it's safe and your mind can just be still peace be still just rest my yoke is easy and it's light just learn to rest just learn to stay here. Go to the peace pump, the peace station. Drink it in just by faith. However it comes to your imagination, you're just going to drink in peace. Let your mind picture yourself receiving it. Because if you can see it, you'll attach faith to it. Just receive. 
This is so easy. Peace. I receive peace. I receive peace in my emotions. I receive peace in my mind. If you have a sickness, sometimes we have rebellious cells that we call cancer. Let's just speak peace to them. Whatever sickness, virus, I speak peace. Pain, I speak peace. Just picture the peace of God like a salve, something that is tangible and real. It's in the unseen realm. It's in God's kingdom. He probably does have a little jar of peace. And you just scoop your hand in. You rub it on whatever part of you needs healing. Whether it's your heart, your mind. We're accessing the realm of the kingdom by our spirit. figure it out. Just lean into it. Later he can tell you what it's about. Just a lot of times we try to activate our brain to find out what the logic is and the why. This isn't the time. You just experience it. Your brain can talk to you later about it. Jesus is just laying his hand, some on your head, and some of your, he's behind you with his hands on your shoulders. He's imparting something to you. Because you've come. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace to receive. And that's what we're doing. That's, that's what an encounter is because we know we can't do it on our own. So just, you know, just like you stand there waiting for gas in your car, can you picture Jesus with his hand on you, filling you up, restoring your soul, taking you places that you've never been before? those of you who have fallen asleep, don't worry about it. Your spirit never sleeps. One of the things I discovered is that people who have lived under stress for a long, long time, when they experience the peace of God, they fall asleep because they're unused to that measure of peace. The first few weeks when I was learning to soak and encounter God, I fell asleep every time. So don't, you know, and if your neighbor is asleep, tell them about this later. Just receive. Feel your spirit, man, in dominion. 
just because your body and your emotions haven't been in peace doesn't mean that your spirit hasn't been in peace. It remains in peace. You're just unaware of it because your body and your emotions are louder than your spirit. The goal is to practice being in the spirit so much that it's louder than your emotions, that it's louder than your body, that it's louder than your brain. One of my favorite things is, you know, a lot of people, because they're afraid of what they might imagine, I tell people, um, use scripture as your diving board into imagining things. You know, go to Revelations, read up on the throne room of God, the rainbow, the crystal sea, the emerald, um, and the gold and all of the glories of God. Use scripture, start imagining what it's like. One of my favorites is from Ezekiel um, 37, 47, one of those, about the river of life that comes from the throne of God. And I try to picture what is a river of life looks like. It's different than just water. What does it do? Why is it that healing flows everywhere it goes? Why are the trees on both sides of it always in, in full bloom and fruitful? So picture the river. What if it's a real place? I believe it is. Go to the river. Put your foot in, take a drink, and if you're really daring, dive. Go to the bottom. Immerse yourself in the river of life flowing from the throne of God. Allow your body to be influenced by the realm of the Spirit. more God something deep within us has always said there's something more that this can't be all there is show us what we have access to show us who we are get used to yourself that confident bold powerful self that when you speak to mountains they move that when you speak to dead bones, they come together and come to life. Put yourself in Ezekiel's place. Do you have some dry bones in your life? Do you have something that looks so dead that there's no flesh on it, they're dry? It's like, God, that promise, that thing is dead. And God says, prophesy to it. Prophesy to your body that still has faith in death and begin to put it under the, the, the reign of the kingdom. Begin to tell your body you will run and not faint. You have the spirit of life activated within you. You may have been broken before, but you're no longer broken. You are whole and perfect and righteous and holy. It's just in you, it hasn't been manifested yet because your brain has been keeping it in tuned. You're gonna be so 
amazed at what's starting to come out of you. As you begin to believe there's something in you that's great and powerful and made in the image of God. That countries all over the world will say, will you come pray over our rivers? Will you come pray over our land? because we see that your God is with you. We see that you're not like everybody else. to show each one an area of their life that they've been struggling with, they've been stressed out over or hopeless about, and allow them to see the real them facing that mountain, that circumstance, that person, that sickness, and allow them to see the spirit within them that's one with your spirit that has dominion and picture to be able to see by the spirit's eye that thing bowing its knee before them. Or them speaking life into something and seeing that divine virtue enter into that circumstance, that person. Even if it's your finances, speak life over it. In the name of Jesus, we call in finances for people right now who are in need. They don't need to struggle with that. That is kindergarten stuff. We need to move on to things that are more powerful. And so we don't want to be wasting prayers on finances. So we just begin to exert a whole new authority in the unseen realm of finances. We come against every lie that has actually been holding you back from receiving what God, the blessings God's given you. Some of you, I feel like God said that you have generational blessings that have been held up by a lie that has been passed down generation to generation, but those blessings have not been lost and all you have to do is begin to claim them. Maybe it's a generational talent for art or writing or speaking or, or even, you know, inventions whatever, or for creating wealth, I call those blessings in. We command the enemy to take his hand off of all those blessings that are generationally supposed to be passed down and they've been held up in past generations. So you're not gonna reap just from what you've sown. You get to reap what some of your past forebearers sowed and never got to see the fruit of. Hmm. You know, God gives glory for shame. And I just saw in the spirit, some people that have had a generational spirit of shame and feeling unworthy, impure. But you were, your, your generational line was actually called to purity and glory. 
And so let's just picture the shame, the unworthiness like a cocoon that it's been built by past generations and belief systems and lies and things that have happened to your body. The enemy can touch your body, but he can't touch your spirit. Your spirit's still completely whole, glorious, and free. So picture you and all your past generations in that cocoon and then start moving your wings, your glory wings. Mm. With every breath, you feel your spirit that butterfly within is beginning to rise up and take shape and is pressing against the resistance and the entombment and there's a breakthrough and the cocoon shatters and you're calling for purity it's always been there. It was just covered up by lies. You're pure, you're worthy, you're whole, you're powerful. You're in dominion, you're no longer the victim. Because you're not fixing what happened in the past. You're just becoming something new. Rise and fly, my sweet ones, my daughters. Rise, feel, feel, feel my power surging through you. Feel my love surging through you. Feel my presence enveloping you. You are loved. You're accepted. I don't look at your physical body. I look at your spirit man, the real you. At whatever moment in time, whatever strength it has right now, I see the potential to fly. We just thank you, Jesus. fly in the spirit. I just saw so many beautiful butterflies flying through the atmosphere where you've taken wing. Fearless, free. This is not a one-time event. It took years to mold you into what you have become because you kept rehearsing what had happened to you. You kept rehearsing the lies about what you thought you were, where now you're going to rehearse what you really are. Every day, you're gonna go into your prayer closet and you're gonna say, show me again. Let me feel it again. Help me to remember that I'm a butterfly breaking out of the cocoon and that there's a spirit within me that carries the image of God and has substance to move the things of this earthly realm. This is me. I love that song from the greatest showman, this is me. She was talking about, I'm, I'm me, I'm this broken person you have to, to receive. But I like to sing that song as, when I feel my spirit rise up, this is me. I am not that weak, pathetic, inadequate person that was shy and never knew what to say. This is me. This is you. The real you. And may we never be the same again in Jesus' name. 
Amen. <sighs> just if you if you want to just continue, you can. There's just a few um, things I want to mention. One is that when we have conferences and we, we get that stirring in our life, it's really good to do something about it. And a lot of times I would think, yeah, I'm going to start doing that. Well, and then I never do it. I have a couple friends, three of them to be exact, and we don't all live in the same city, so now we do it by Zoom. But when God would begin to talk to us, we would do it as a group because we have a set meeting time. Every Tuesday morning, we have our experimental group. And sometimes it's hard to stop talking, but we always try to make sure that we spend more time just resting in his presence, talking about what we see in the spirit, getting confirmation from each other gather a group of like-minded people around you and have soaking times together, it will keep you more regular to do it. Even if it's just once a week, it's once a week more than you used to. Even if it's once a month, do something that reignites, oh yeah, that was powerful. Oh yeah, I felt different when I did that. I mean, we all love the spirit. The problem is, is we don't realize that it, it, the spirit man is almost like a muscle that has to be used. Babies aren't born with, they're, they're born with muscle, but their muscles aren't coordinated enough to do what they're supposed to do. So our spirit, when it's born again, it actually needs usage. <laughs> It needs to, you know, I, I think we need spiritual gems more than physical gems. Maybe somebody here would like to start that. My husband and I, we, um, when we pastored in Weaverville, California, we would um, let different groups use our building. And one of them was for AA, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and those kind of groups. And one day, my husband and I were thinking, you know, why is it all these groups are so focused on getting from crisis to average? Why isn't there any group that takes people from average to greatness? And so we started a group. We called it Mediocres Anonymous. We're experimenters. We're daring to do something out of the box. Why don't you get some unsaved friends and say, would you like to join Mediocres Anonymous? <laughs> because God just doesn't want to take you out of something. He wants to take you into something. Because if you don't get taken into something, you'll go back to the something. Do you want to do any questions and, or answers, or do you want to quit, or do you guys have any questions? Something that, I've just been so excited about the message. I, I realize every time after I speak that I would start on one subject and end on a different one. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I'm just trusting Holy Spirit was talking to you um, through the Spirit, not through my words. Um, but if there's something you want to ask or you know, have me explain better. Raise your hand. I know it's hard to come back to this realm. <laughs> I 
I don't mind waiting. You're readjusting. Yes. That's awesome. Good question. Um, it kind of reminds me, uh, Chris Valentin, I don't know, you guys, do you guys know who Chris Valentin is? Um, he's one of the senior leaders at Bethel. Um, very prophetic, highly sought after speaker too. Just his stories would scare you. Um, in fact, I was afraid to even meet him because I'd heard about him, and I was like, oh, no, he's going to know everything I've ever done. <laughs> but he said he always tries to be aware of knowing who's further along in the spirit than he is because that's going to determine what he does. If he is in contact with someone who actually, you know, has made some breakthrough in area he hasn't he's going to sit at their feet and it's something that you have to kind of learn to discern he said he learned it because um, bill johnson's always been his pastor ever since he was saved and bill johnson is such a man of wisdom you know he just says things and everybody's like whoa and um they went out to lunch with some people who wanted to get to know Bill, and they're sitting at lunch, and the people who wanted to get to know Bill, all they spent the whole lunch hour talking. And Bill's sitting there like, you know what, if I was you,